All right, Ben Manning, today is Thursday. It's October 13th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports. Today, my guest is producer extraordinaire Chicago man, uh, Dan Filato. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Dan, so here's here's how I'm going to describe Dan. So, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. It's it's your straight should be the first word. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, okay. That's correct. Um, you know, we have a lot of people on this show, Dan. We've had anywhere from plumbers. Uh, we've had John Wayne Gacy's lawyer on here, and, and, and that's what we do. And, and and what I find interesting is just good conversations. You're like in between. You're like a sports guy. You're like a, a little bit of a little just a little bit of everything Chicago. I, I would say because you've what, what, what's the what's the list here? You've roomed with Mark Grace. Yeah, ten you, years. Ten years. <laughs> you were, you roomed with Artie Lang. Yes. Uh, yeah. Four years. Four years yeah. with Artie Lang, and you just kind of have always been fascinating to me because. You're just a guy who's kind of been through it all from from my lens. And it's, you know, sometimes the guy behind the guy is almost more interesting. Is there somebody behind? <laughs> but, I know you liked it on that show. <laughs> I saw the girl, uh, the woman that was yes. sitting behind you. Yeah, she's scary. And me. you literally look at your computer. Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> hey, before I really kick off here, I want to talk to you guys about my friends at Miller Lite. Um, listen, Dan's a Chicago guy. I'm sure he's enjoyed uh, quite a few Miller Lights in his day. And uh, I know that he believes that when you order a light beer, you're looking for a beer that's uh, light on calories, but it also tastes like beer. And that's uh, looked no further than Miller Light because if you love taste with only 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounce serving, uh, the beer that tastes like beer is Miller Lite, of course. So um, I love it. We all love it in this office. You guys know it by now. We've been with Miller Lite since 2018. And really, I've been with Miller Lite ever since I started uh, enjoying adult beverages when I turned 21. So Miller Lite knows that beer lovers want their light beer to taste like beer. I can't say that enough. All these other bland light beers that taste like water, throw those out of your life and get going with Miller Lite. So they brew that light beer that's light on calories, not on taste, because what's the point of having a beer if you can't taste it. To get Miller Lite delivered right to your door, visit MillerLite.com slash Redline, or you can find it pretty much wherever that they sell beer, especially here in Chicago, but across the nation that factors in as well. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. All right, let's get back into the show with Dan. But that's kind of what I find interesting. You've had a, a, an awesome career, so I'm yeah, excited I've to have you. Yeah, I've had a great life. I never, ever thought I would have had the life that I did. So, but I just, I, I took a shot and it worked out and, you know, I just knew I could never work in an office. So. Yeah. And so, so, so tell me about it. How did it begin? It begins kind of with the, your first job. You were part of Disco Demolition Night. Well, it wasn't, um, that wasn't my first job. I worked at a station in Waukegan. Okay. And I wrote this guy, a they, they played Springsteen music other than Born to Run. <laughs> and uh, it was WXLC. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the guy a letter and I said, hey, listen. You're, the music you play on your station is great. And it was different than all the other stations in Chicago. Um, so I said, it's awesome the music you play, but your disc jockeys stink. And so he said, he wrote me a letter back and he said, well, if you think you're so funny or good, write some jokes. And so I took the paper and I just started writing it uh, like <laughs> during it, all the classes that were should have been important to me in high school. I started <laughs> writing jokes from the paper. And uh, I sent him a letter back about two weeks later. And thank God um, my parents weren't home uh, to get the call because then the guy called me and he said, hey, how old are you? And I said, uh, yeah. And we started talking about something else or whatever. And he said, do you, my overnight guy quit. Do you want the job? And I said, sure. So I took the job and uh, I didn't, never told him my age. And, um, and how old were you at the time? Uh, 15. 15, so yeah. you're just a Taft student. You're a, you're a freshman yes. at Taft? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I took the job, and so I did overnights for a while. And then Steve and Gary, Steve Dahl and Gary Meyer, were driving to Milwaukee, and I guess Steve heard me. And then a friend of mine knew Gary, and he said, hey, I know that guy. And so Steve and Gary both kept in touch. They'd invite me to shows. And then when they needed a new producer, they called me up and they said, hey, do you want to do the job? And I said, sure. Okay. And for people that nationally are listening, uh, Gary Meyer, Steve Dollar, two Chicago radio legends. Right. 
Like they are the guy, like the people you grew up listening to, whether it be, you know, Bob and Tom, whoever, like they were the guys in Chicago. Right. And we, you know, Howard was still in college and I know that he gives homage to and praise to Stephen Geary for most of the stuff that he did. Cause there's stuff on that I never got to listen to because we didn't have Howard Stern here um, that were my ideas. So I never got to hear it until working with Artie and Artie would have it on in the background. I'm like, wait a minute, Jane, the cleaning lady, <laughs> Jane, the cleaning was, was this woman that came into my office every day at WLS. And that's how we came up with the idea. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of other stuff on there. So that was, I've always heard that because there was always, because Howard was very, very particular about people he thought were copying him. Right. Now there were always kind of rumblings that, like you just said, that he maybe lifted some stuff from Dahl. Do, do you well, okay. So one of the first uh, lunches that I had with Artie Lang uh, when they offered me the direct TV job, we went out to lunch and he said, Howard's always had respect for Stephen Gary. And why doesn't he beat on them? And I said, I didn't know because I absolutely didn't. We didn't have a lot of Stern here. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and so we talked about it and we talked about it on the direct TV show. And the next time we went to Philadelphia, I already played the Borgata. The guy who runs CBS radio in Philadelphia introduced himself and we started talking. He goes, Artie, um, I was the one that sent the Stephen Gary tapes to Howard twice a week. I sent cassettes and if I didn't send them, Howard would get mad. Oh, wow. And Artie just went white. He goes, wow. He just, he, he goes, so Dan's been telling the truth. He goes, yep, everything he said was the truth. Wow. So, and, but Howard took it to places and the genius that he is, that Stephen Gary could have never done it. What, what do you like think that. was different? What, what, what did they do? What did Howard do differently? That well, he didn't have a drug problem. That was number one. Steve did. Oh, really? Yeah. And, uh, and the, in a lot of the corp, there were two or three offers where we got a chance to be a network show. Oh, really? And yeah. it just went badly because of his issues, whether it would be drinking or drugs. So they weren't syndicated at all? No, not when, wow. yeah, not when I started. So. Okay. So that's what, that's what you feel kind of held them back where they could have, they could have exceeded. Yeah. We were doing a, a network show once, uh, uh, an hour, uh, an hour a week, I mean, and it was taped and it was edited and it just wasn't Stephen Gary and it was sent out to stations. They wanted it to be like, uh, Dr. Tomento or, you know, those, those, shows that used to see on the radio stations or mm -hmm. sorry here on the radio stations. So that's what they wanted it to be, but it never just worked out that way. So. Gotcha. And that then, you know, with Steven's Gary's success on WLS AM, that's when we got, you know, uh, offers and they flew us to New York and the meeting went badly with Steve. And I remember walking out and the guy just looking at Gary and I saying, there's no way we're giving you a show. Wow. So on a network show. Was that tough for you then? Were you like ready for your career to kind of launch like that? Or were you? Uh, yeah, but I already knew I was kind of leaving. I knew that at some point, once we went back to, uh, th that was when WLS had to make this huge decision on whether to keep us or not. We were number one. There was no, even, and that, that was the first time anyone had ever beaten WGN, who had Bob Collins on at the time. And we just blew everyone away and had, you know, monster ratings and everyone took notice. And I thought, okay, I'm going to stick around for a little bit longer um, because we we're probably either going to be at a new station or here under different circumstances. And when we went to the new station and actually the things that I worried about, I was going to, I worried Steve was going to die on me. So oh, yeah. I cared about him a lot. And, yeah. uh, I, that's what I was afraid of. And yeah. I was, when I first started in radio, I lived right near Second City and John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd used to crash in my apartment to get away from things. My my dad said it was okay to uh, have this apartment. So I would, and I would still go to school, but I had to be closer to downtown and to radio. And how old are radio. you right now? Uh, just, I was about to turn 16. You're this young and you're- yeah. So you're 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 about to turn sixteen. Yeah. 
You have a, you're, you're living at your parents' house in Nord Park. Right. And then you have an apartment downtown where John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd are crashing at. Right. What the fuck? How does that? <laughs> and a, a guy offered my dad, they, they passed a law where cops had to live in the city. So a cop came up to our house and offered my dad an amazing amount of money for our house. And my mom was pregnant with my brother, Dave, who owns all the Chicago Jets pizzas, by the way. And uh, (laughs) brought some Jets. Thank you to Dan. Brought some gifts for the boys. And uh, so go to Jets. And um, he uh, and so we needed another bedroom because we only had two. I have have a sister and we only had two bedrooms. We only actually had two bedrooms. And then I lived in the attic. And so my the guy offered a ton of money to my dad and he took it. And, you know, he said, "Okay, well, we're going to be moving to where my parents moved, like, no, no way, I'm mm-hmm. not moving. Yeah, there's no no possible way. You're out. Uh, and um, you know, I was it, it's just starting to. There were a couple of people that I knew um, in high school, like a couple of really close friends that knew that I was working with Stephen Gary. I I kept it kind of quiet for a while. Why? Why was that? You would think a high school kid would be just because well, you didn't I was, want them to cut it out. I was worried. You know, I I, I was worried that maybe that it might affect something at school or yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was shy. Did they know you were so young or like you, they had to have like, there had to be paperwork or something. No, they that. didn't know. I was so, no. Cause I was getting $40 a week from Steve when I started. Stop. And I thought so you were under the books, under the books. Right. And wow. I thought, um, <laughs> that the best thing to do either, I just didn't want to go, um, uh, Kenosha to Madison yeah, to yeah, Milwaukee. Yeah. I wanted to stay in Chicago. Yep. When, you know, once you're here, you don't want to leave. Yep. And, uh, and so I, I thought, well, here's my chance. And it, it was right before they exploded into these, you know, national figures. And mm-hmm. I decided, you know, this is what I'll do. And so that's how that turned into Belushi and Aykroyd's uh, crash pad. Cause they were buddies with Stephen Gary, kinda, or yes, yeah, okay, yeah, and but, it's like, hey, we got this right. kid; he's got an apartment down here, right? And then, uh, but I, so did they pay for it then? How did you afford it? Forty. Well, I uh, I actually worked at Checker Oil in the morning. I did after Stephen Gary. I did the books, so I'd come in around eleven o'clock. I'd do the books for like four hours, and then, um, you know, and then do my high school work. And uh, the, the the classes that I had to go to, I would make sure that I was there. And then after after school, I would go to Checker and and do that until nighttime. <laughs> this is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, I I, I, you know, I think back about this stuff too. And like I played football, but at the end of the day, where did that get me? You know, like like you know, where does well an know. amazing body first yeah, of all? Yeah, that's true. I don't have that. Yeah, you don't. You don't have the defensive lineman figure. That's, right, that, that's a fact. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I think about that, too, and, like, what could have helped me do this? And I, I guess, you know, the, the camaraderie of sports and, and everything like that, and that, that helps you get where you are. But I wonder how much different it is for kids if they start thinking that way, you know? Um, you know what? I wish I did have that um, I could never work in an office attitude already. Mm-hmm. I never knew that I was funny. I mm-hmm. never knew that I was a good putting things together. I was on the stage crew at Taft only to get out of classes. And we had this like kind of youngerish uh, teacher that dated a lot of the students that kind of kept me, you know, away from having, getting into any real trouble. Yeah. And, um, uh, but I also then at, that was my decision and I knew exactly when I made it and I'd take a shot at it. But then I had uh, to meet, Harry Shearer, when I was really young, and to for him to be your best friend, he, he's older. He had been in show business for a lot of time, and uh, that he actually has helped me more than anyone. Of Harry Shearer, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not too familiar with him. Well, Harry wrote Spinal Tap, and uh, he was a actor. He was on Saturday Night Live for two stints. Uh, some of the best skits ever on Saturday Night Live are his, a synchronized swimming, lifestyles of the relatives of the rich and famous, uh, in some mink men. Um, and then he's done a radio show for 40 something years. And, oh, okay. uh, and he does all the voices on the Simpsons, except for the family, pretty much. Oh, okay. I know this. I know him. All right. So, all right. Yeah. So then, sorry, let's go back. There's so many, so many, so many spots here, Dan. So what, like how much interaction did you have with the Blues Brothers? A lot. En- enough that you know uh, 
I, well, you know, they were do they were doing the Blues Brothers here. Yeah. Uh, and then a lot of times they would crash over my apartment. And then when uh, John was doing Continental Divide and he wanted to get away from everyone, he would come and crash at my apartment. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, you know, enough that they know who I am and uh, I'm going to be jumping around here. But about five years ago, Artie did a favor for Harry Shearer. Uh, he does this Christmas show with his wife. That's amazing. They do it here in Chicago all, uh, every year. And um, Artie did a favor for him and Harry wanted to take Artie out to dinner. And it was a surprise because Don Rickles was there. Be- Don had done a movie with Artie. Mm-hmm. And then Dan and Dirty his wife, work. Dan Aykroyd and his wife, Donna, and then Peter LaSalle from The Tonight Show. Okay. And it was supposed to be this great, you know, dinner, and then Artie didn't show. We were in Los Angeles and Artie didn't show. No shit. So it's just me and, uh, you know. Uh, Which, I'm, I mean, I'm sure a situation you've been in before. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yes, yeah. I'm sure. But it, so was, 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 was up. It was, so anyway, what I was, I'm sorry. What I was saying was, is that Danny recognized me the second. I'm a little thinner than I was uh, around that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at the old Stephen Gary photos, but he's like, Dan. And then his wife's looking at him like, how do you know this guy? He goes, well, you're not going to believe this, but uh, John and I <laughs> used to crash over at his apartment across the street. Remember, they had that illegal bar, too. Uh, well, you're not too old enough. They had an illegal bar for about five years. Uh, on right uh, down the block from Second City on Wells. Okay. And uh, it was a celebrity hangout. I mean, and I would be the designated driver for Steve. Uh, Gary normally didn't need a driver, but for Steve, I would make sure he got home and uh, Keith Richards would be in there and all the 85 Bears would be in there. And it was just an illegal bar. And Jane Byrne at the time said, let them do whatever they want. And that I, I'd be sitting there with Diet Cokes the entire night. Oh, wow. And and Danny recognized me and he's That's like, I haven't cool. seen him in so long. Yeah. And, you know, he exchanged numbers and everything. And he, it was even something that Harry didn't know that I knew Danny so well. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, was, um, was Belushi as wild as everyone says? He wasn't around me. No. Uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, nothing... Pff, Artie was way worse. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. But, um, no, he wasn't, mm-hmm. you know. And I didn't see, I, like, any of the heroin stuff. I didn't see that. No. And during Continental Divide, I know that he was clean because he, Smokey, who was his uh, um, security guy, he, you know, kept an eye on him. He gotcha. never let him out of his sight. Gotcha. And do you, do you still talk to Steve Dahl? No. 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 I went back in 2001 because I got an amazing job offer from CBS. And mm-hmm. then uh, we we had some issues. <laughs> there were some. So it's a falling out or you just don't keep in touch? We don't keep in touch. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was, it was like, yeah, yeah. When, when my name gets attached to something that I didn't know about it and I was really upset about it. And I went to CBS and they said, this is wrong. And then then uh, they, they promoted me and said, um, we're just not going to have you work with them anymore. Gotcha. Okay. So, so, so dialing it back too. So you're, you're ready to go because you think you're worried about Steve and then you move on and then you go to ABC. Is that right? Um, or, from, from when WLS. Oh, I, I went back to WLS. Okay. I stayed at WLS and I got okay. to work with, um, Fred Winston, John Landecker. And then I didn't work much with Larry Lujak, but I kind of, coordinated stuff okay and so i stayed and did that for a while and then um harry was always harry Shear was always getting me involved in stuff and um i i had done some stuff for the nfl where i wrote they brought over one game a week to london and i wrote kind of british jokes for um the nfl and they liked that so i did that for a while and wgn kept on calling my parents, um, because they wanted to get in touch with me, the the head guy at WGN, and they they couldn't they didn't know anyone who had my number, and so WGN kept on calling and calling, and said we want to we want to hire you. I go, why would you want to hire me? We you know made fun of all the WGN personalities, and Dan Fabian, our boss, said that's why we want to hire you. Yeah, we need to go younger, mm-hmm. and so um, 
I was there, I was supposed to be hired as like a programming programming consultant, but they wa- they were getting rid of Spike O'Dell. They didn't think he had it, and so Dan called me in because there were he had to answer some people too. And Dan called me in and he said, "Hey, do you think you can do anything with him?" And I said, "Yeah, I do. I he's talented." And then, well, Dan said we have to figure out a way to kind of ease you into that show because we don't do things very fast here at WGN. And the next day, Spike's producer wins forty-four million dollars in the lottery. Stop. So they needed a they needed a <laughs> new producer. The next day. He wins the lottery, and he's just up and up and quit. Well, when you, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. That's always an interesting question, right? I definitely wouldn't. If I was, it was always that AM driver was that afternoons. Uh, he was afternoons. He was okay. doing it. Spike yeah. was doing afternoons, yeah. and they were about to get rid of him. They uh-huh. didn't think he had it. Wow, forty-four mil. Did yep. you know the guy? Just for like two weeks, yeah. he like showed me how to use the equipment and stuff, and and he was like probably the most half-assed training in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, guy. no, 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 he did that before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he had to train me for the rest of the stuff. They wanted to hire me, and they also wanted to do you know get some younger sports mm-hmm. people listening, and you know all the old sports, all the shows were geared toward older older people and so that's why they kind of they originally hired me for special projects and sports Mm -hmm. and then um and then the spike thing happened so i did spike for a year and a half and then a girl that i kind of groomed to be to be a producer worked with him and she was great okay and then uh they promoted me to sports director okay and and they go back to harry too so how how does harry how how did everything with harry come about when when stephen gary went on vacation he harry was on uh, Saturday Night Live in 79. He replaced Belushi and Aykroyd. And I thought a couple of the things that he did were the funniest things in the world. Now, I was a huge Harry fan before that. He was in a, a comedy group called The Credibility Gap. Okay. And they used to make fun of the Rose Parade. And they put it out on an album. And we just, I, I, I loved it. I loved The Credibility mm-hmm. Gap's writing. I loved it. I, I loved it actually better than the improv that I was, you know, I would see every night. And when Stephen Geary would go on vacation, they would have music DJs fill in for us. So I suggested to our boss, why don't we try and get like somebody who's really good, you know, at radio or somebody famous. And he goes, oh, well, you can get somebody famous for this amount of money to go ahead and do it. And we'll get a hotel room and airline ticket. And I said, okay. And Harry was the first person that came to mind because he just left SNL. He wasn't going back. And I said, um, and I, I couldn't get in touch with him. He didn't have an agent. I didn't know how to get in touch with him. And I knew somebody at the Tribune. And he said to me, I said, listen, do you guys, in, in some of the movies, you see like in the newsrooms, they have all the phone books. Can I come in and look at the phone book? Uh, your phone books and he goes yeah sure so i came in and he he was in the phone book and so i called him and i started to mention who i was and he picked up the phone and he goes and i said i work with steve Dahl and gary meyer they're these two and he goes i know who they are and uh we started talking he goes this is what i want um he said uh i'll do it i'll do it for that amount of money but you're in chicago i want to meet paul harvey because he had been listening to Paul Harvey since he was a kid. And uh, luckily, Paul Harvey's office was right next to mine. And uh, the, so that's how I became friends with Harry. And we bonded. I mean, oh, we both loved the NBA and just bonded about the the uh, missing, the old Perkadan, Jerry Lewis telethons at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. We just bonded over that. And we just started talking like all the time. And uh, that's how we became friends. Awesome, that's uh, that's such a radio story. Like yeah. you're just you're digging around, going to the Tribune, looking for a phone book. Yeah. Hey, we need you for this amount, and then he he yep. was he was all about it. Where he lived, it was right there in the phone book. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and and so so you can you continue on with your career trajectory. Now here's something I didn't even mention yet, which might fascinate people the most is you were Stephen A. Smith's producer. Yes, I was. <laughs> And What's you know it? what? I have to tell you something. He was is one of the best people I've ever worked with. Stephen A. Smith, one of the best people you ever worked ever. with. Ever. 
Yeah. And I, you know, I know he's a polarizing guy yeah. to a lot of people, but to me, um, he was, he absolutely gave me credit for all the stuff that, you know, I came up with and we, um, he had, he had left ESPN. I, he had gotten fired from ESPN, I believe, or they didn't renew his contract. And then Fox Sports Radio had called me. Um, I had, was in Washington because President Obama had suggested me to kind of run this radio network because he listened to Steve Dahl all the time in Chicago. <laughs> this is crazy, Dan. And so he Obama listened, handpicked you for this? He, he mentioned my name yeah. to them. Uh -huh. And this huge radio company, when they called me, said, we have all the right wingers. We have Hannity, we have Beck, we have nobody on the left. I'm like, well, I'm not on the left. I'm more center. And they said, yeah, but you have a good sense of broadcasting. And I said, well, let me, let, well, I was on a tour with uh, the guys from Spinal Tap mm -hmm. and uh, we, they done a small tour. I go, when I get back from the tour, let's, let's talk about it. And so um, uh, he had suggested me and then a couple other people had suggested me. Um, they all listened to... Harry Shearer's Le Show, which is a radio show he's been doing for 40 something years. It was on here in Chicago. And it was on a lot of the uh, national public radio stations. And Obama listened, Rahm Emanuel listened, David Axelrod listened, they all listened. And so my name, Harry will mention me every once in a while and Obama remembered that. And, and so that then I went to, um, uh, I went to Washington and I, I, I got sick to my stomach like every day having to get up because it was just you, you just, there aren't enough, there isn't enough water in Lake Michigan to shower enough to get that stench off of you, the people in Washington. Really? And what I bad? saw. Yeah. It's just, it's, they're all, they're all corrupt and they're all, no you know, shit. some are, some are better than others, but they're, you just, you just never get that stink off you. And I, I, I didn't want to be there. I just did not want to be there. Yeah. Do you feel like you're pretty good at uh, sniffing out the bullshit? Yes. Yeah, I'm very good at it. How long did it take you to like really get into that? Because I, I was, you know, it, in, in the position like I'm in now too, like you, you see it going on, you know, and I'm like, man, it's, it is kind of, you know, you do have your intuition, but. Uh, well, I try to like think the best of everybody, especially, yeah, yeah, exactly, you know, exactly. But there are no more uh, Lincolns or Jeffersons there. <laughs> yeah, I, I got yeah, news yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. Um so I, you know, I tried to think the best and you would, they, all they cared about was, were celebrity. Um, uh, the, the exact same words I heard from Mike Huckabee, who had been a guest a couple of times. I heard from uh, Chuck Todd. I mean, all I care about is being famous. Yeah. And you're like, wow, you know, not running the country or not being the watchdog to run the country. So what was that program called again? Uh, I, it was a like kind of a, a premiere. Just were setting up different people. The the one they had moved to Washington. Her name was Randy Rhodes, and she had worked at Air America. But they were, we wanted to set up other programming too. But I wanted out of there as quickly as possible, and so I did. And uh, this, but they promoted me to New York, and that's where I worked with Stephen A. Okay, so then that's where so you moved to Washington initially because of the Obama connection, right? To do this left wing centrist political show, right? And then you're like, I want out, and then New York Premier, which had owned the, you know, they were setting up the. It was more Premier Radio because they were worried that everyone would come after him because they had all the right wingers. Okay, and so um, so they were trying to yeah. diverse it a little bit. Yeah, so uh -huh. they that's that's uh, that. They wanted me to to oversee it, and I just I got out of there, and I said, "Listen, I'm leaving at the end of the year." And they said, "No, don't." And we've got this other show, and so I said, "Okay." And I said, "Well, who is it?" And they wouldn't tell me who it was with, and um, they then until we got closer, and it was Stephen A. And we met in Washington, and um, it was the two of us in New York in a studio, and then nine or ten people in Los Angeles, and. Um, it was, uh, it was, we had a great time and he mm -hmm. was, he was wonderful to me all the time. Um, and, uh, I know some people say that he's not like that all the time, but he was never like that around me. And it was just the two of us for a long, I mean, every, and you know, he, 
if there was a holiday or if he knew I couldn't go back to Chicago, he'd make sure that I had something to do or do you want to come to my house and have dinner with us? He was just great. We had a great time. So one of the best. Yeah. 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 And um, on the decision, the LeBron decision, the day before he was about to make the, the, do the TV show, Stephen A had been saying for weeks, and they had promos running on Fox Sports Radio that, you know, he's going to Miami, he's going to Miami. And Stephen A's uh, guy, his source, called him and said, hey, he's, cha- he's thinking about changing his mind now. And we, so I called our bosses in Los Angeles and they had asked us to tone it down a little bit of Stephen A's exclusive in case it goes wrong. And Stephen A didn't want to do that. And then, so they said, um, you know, if he does, start looking for another job, which was fine. You know, uh, that happens all the time. Yeah. And so Stephen A called me and said, hey, he might be changing his mind. Is there anyone that you know? And luckily, um, Mark Grace had dated a girl that worked in the NBA office. Mm-hmm. And I, I always kept in touch with Mark's exes because <laughs> it always came in, you know, uh, I just didn't want them, you know, a lot of them lived around our, in our neighborhood and I just didn't want, you know, anyone come up and smacking me. So yeah. I, I, you know, I played the nice guy uh, uh-huh. of Mark's exes and um, she called me back and she said, okay, off, they put in the paperwork for Miami. So, and Stephen A gave me credit and I think it was Larry King. He did Larry King then because he was the only person that said LeBron was going to Miami. No shit. So yeah. you were on the beat. Yeah. So you never. And Stephen A gave me credit for it too. Really? Yeah. On the, like on the air? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Yep. You're just like my producer, Dan, he was. Yeah. He didn't over. say that it was Mark Grace's ex-girlfriend because then everybody <laughs> would have figured it out. Yeah. But. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, I'm jealous of you because you weren't like me being a sucker sitting here in Chicago thinking we get a chance. So <laughs> yeah. that's nice. Yeah, it was it was closer than people thought, you know, so to come in here or staying in Cleveland, uh, both. Yeah. You know, having been um, uh, and you know what? I'll tell you, uh, I can tell you now who said it. It was Dwayne Wade. Now, Dwayne knew me from Mark Grace mm-hmm. and. Um, he, we had met a couple of times and then he listened to sports radio here. So he knew my name uh, from, from that. And we were out in Los Angeles with Stephen A. And this is, this is perfect way to tell you a story about Stephen A. We were out in Los Angeles and we did the show. We did the, we were on three o'clock in the morning, you know, or, I'm sorry, six o'clock in the morning in New York, but none of the stations in New York carried the show. So we were on at three o'clock in the morning in Los Angeles. So, you know, it, 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 a lot of that, that had to do with, you know, it not working there is the time that we were on. Mm-hmm. But we did the show. D. Wade was on the show. And he said, hey, I'm going to a party night. Do you guys want to go? And we said, yeah, sure. And, you know, Stephen A. was on me all day today. Dan for Fala- Chicago, Dan, this is not one of those Chicago house party, you know. <laughs> and you know, Steve, that's just the way, that was just our yeah. relationship. And we go to this private club and um, before Stephen A walks in the door first, he walks back down the stairs, he turns to Dwayne Wade and I, who I casually know, I don't know that well. And he said, I don't want you guys hanging around me. Stephen A rolls alone. And I said, and we thought he was joking. He goes, no, I'm serious. Don't be hanging around me. Both of you. And Dwayne Wade was like, are you kidding me? Who is, who does he think he is? (laughs) And we just started laughing the entire time. And uh, we, we kept in, we were in like a VIP area and Stephen A was walking around meeting the people, but he did not, he did not want us around. What does that even mean? Why, why was, I, 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 he just didn't want us. He rolls, he, you know, I've seen him like get into places that, you know, he didn't have credentials for, or he just wanders on in. That's the way he is. And people, hey, it's Stephen A. And they just let him in. So there have been plenty of times when we didn't have tickets for some celebrity event and stuff. And then Stephen A. would just kind of roll in. I go, do we have tickets? He goes, no. And he goes, go, I'll get us in. I'll get us in. So, Jeez. He didn't want to be seen hanging out with you and Dwayne Wade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? I mean, it wasn't, he, he wasn't, you know, it was just, he had a certain vibe at a club. Yeah. And he liked to, that vibe. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't involve a pudgy white guy from Chicago or a, a guard from Miami. Oh, my God, dude. 
That's that's crazy. I've heard like you know because he's got the rambunctious personality, but I've heard off. He just like he just you know. No, we well had chill. a great time, and it's just the two of us. And uh, day two, a major thing happened where um, Stephen A. was right in 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 what we needed to do, and we just bonded from that day on. And uh, he was he was great to me. He was absolutely great to me. And then, not many people know this, but. He got offered the Oprah job when she retired. And so he flew to Chicago. I had come back and he flew to Chicago and we had dinner and he said, I'm going there tomorrow, but I'm telling them I want you involved in the show. And so I said, okay, great. And he, because he knew I was thinking about going, I had a job offer in London and uh, to work on some comedy stuff. And he knew that I might think about it because I want you, if I'm here, uh, you got to be here with me, Chicago Dan. Chicago Dan. <laughs> and um, and then the next night we had dinner and they offered him less money than I was making. So that's how, you know, they, and so he's like, I'm not, no I'm way not I'm taking the job. Yeah. But they, yeah, they offered him though. He was one of the people they, they, they wanted, they told him what the money was and then they wanted to try him out for a week, but he'd been on television all the time. So, um, uh, they he he was like no I turned that it down. was it yep Oprah uh, yep. Stephen A Smith Oprah to Stephen A Smith yep that'd be something and then they went with the local programming yeah I, I don't do they still have it on I don't even know I know yeah. I know Rosie broadcasted from her building for a little bit there mm. uh, at Harpo now it's McDonald's HQ but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's crazy um, now uh, so going back so did you ever have a sit down with Barack. Like were you and Obama? Uh, like yeah, a- we've had um, uh, Michelle Obama's favorite player, uh, other than her dad's favorite player, is Mark Grace. Oh, and really? so we had, um, I got invited to a couple of White House things. And uh, we, and I, I had met him here in Chicago. Mm-hmm. There was, uh, so when I was working with Steve Dahl the second time, there, uh, his son was the Northwestern Wildcat, Willie the Wildcat. And he said, you know, dad, you can buy these things for like $6,000, these giant heads. Mascot, yeah. Yeah, mascot heads. And so we were thinking about it and we said, well, we're going to have, Steve at that point didn't want to do, we were doing really well in the ratings. He didn't want to do a lot of, uh, of live events. So we said, well, we'll send Big Steve instead. And Obama had... Um, I had been walking, I, I parked in the Hyatt Regency and I walked through the Hyatt Regency. I didn't know who he was. And I heard him give a speech once. And I walked in, I said to Steve, I go, man, there's this guy that I just saw in the Hyatt. We should have him on the show. You know, when he talks politics, he's an amazing political speaker. And so Steve said, yeah, sure. We'll have him on. Well, we got big Steve made and we sent it to one of Barack's, uh, fundraisers. And everyone there thought it was a big Dick Cheney. So they had Big Steve arrested oh. and you know taken out. And then when they found out that it was Big Steve, Obama called into the show. But Steve had this habit of trying to make people feel bad before they came on a show or ripping them. And so he did about two or three minutes on who is this guy? Why are we having him on? He's a loser. He's not even gonna, he's not even gonna win the Senate. And so I, I picked up the phone and I said, hey, listen, this probably isn't the best time to come on. And he made him wait for 10 or 15 minutes. Really? Yep. And, um, and so then he, so then you got to remember that when he ran for Senate, the first two candidates, like had, uh, there was a wife beating with one and the huge money. There were, he was like third or fourth. And then the Republican guy, it was uh, Ryan, and who Steve actually wanted to win. But then the actress wife said that she wanted, he wanted, I, you know what, I don't want to misquote it, was something he always wanted the wife to do with other people sexually. And Oh, I, I vaguely Jack, remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember what his yeah, name yeah, yeah. was. I forget, I forget and so then wrong. Obama becomes senator. And, um, oh, you know, Obama still, when he was in town, listened to the show sometimes and he certainly listened to Harry Shearer show every week which was on uh, Sunday nights on WBEZ so um that's how we all became be, became acquainted mm-hmm. 
But when I was in Washington, I got to go to a, a function with him and we got into a huge fight over who had the higher class fans, the Cub fans or the Sox <laughs> fans. And we, you know, we were, we were going at it, the two of us. And uh, it was pretty funny because the Secret Service guy wasn't used to somebody like busting <laughs> his chops so bad. Yeah. So, um, uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, I was in this office uh, and I was supposed to go back to Chicago that week, that weekend. It was a holiday weekend that I got invited to, to do something with the president. And if it starts to rain in Washington, D.C., Reagan International shuts down. It, there's, it's not like O'Hare. I mean, even like a little rain, it slows down and they cancel flights. That's it. And on a Friday night, I'm like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to go. I'm going to be sitting there all night. So I went back to my office. And uh, I, it was in a, a cluster of radio stations. And I went, I checked my email, I had one email, and I walked around, and then I checked my email again, and there's like 300. And I'm like, uh-oh, something happened. And um, I went through the, and there was a story in Deadspin that a woman had had her back tattooed with Gracie's girl, because she had dated Mark. Mm -hmm. And the husband knew it. And none of us had ever, ever confirmed it. And so, because you get asked about it all the time. And um, so then Mark, uh, so then our lawyer, his son was going for a job interview and didn't know that it was somebody who knew the guys at Deadspin and said, oh yeah, well, let me tell you about this girl in St. Louis, blah, 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 and confirmed the story. And then it went all over uh, you know, Deadspin. Deadspin. It went yeah. all over the United States, all over the world. And so 300 emails. Uh, Cal Ripken Jr., Barry Bonds, you know, all these emails from people. This never happened on your watch, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in Chicago. Because they all, yeah. all, I covered for all those players all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the very last one was from, President Obama saying, oh, yeah, you Cub fans are real high class. <laughs> so I got oh, him to shit. sign it for uh, for Gracie. Oh, shit. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Wait, so explain the story again. So so Mark Grace, he, he had someone, he had a woman tattoo Gracie's girl on her yeah, back. Yeah. And she was married, I guess. And the husband knew that Mark was the, I, I guess. I don't remember what the story was. Yeah. And there was a lot, you know, what he, what he did on the road, I, I really didn't. Um, you know, it's not like uh, we came back and talked about like, yeah, yeah, oh, how did yeah. your weekend go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was running a radio station, the sports department. Yeah. But we had the Cubs, the Bears, DePaul, Northwestern. Yeah. You know, so I didn't really have time. And, you know, Mark and I didn't. Um, and so Barry Bonds and all these guys are reaching out to you being like, oh. They saw the Deadspin story. That story got yeah. leaked because you weren't there to, yeah, yeah, to get in yeah. front of it. <laughs> yeah. No oh, yeah. shit. So you had a relationship with Barry Bonds? Yes. Um, this uh, is, who do you you know? Everyone, dude. Uh, Mark was in the uh, country. <laughs> Mark, Mark was in the Cleveland All Star Game, and there. <laughs> oh God, he had invited um, a lot of his female friends to the game. Okay, and he said, "Can you do do that thing with your computer where you print out the seating chart?" So he goes, let's get up early in the morning and let's figure out where we're going to put all these girls in Cleveland. And I got there about five minutes ahead of time and it was a players only um, breakfast area. But my name was at the door. So Barry comes in. So he's the second person to come in. There was a, actually there was another player over in the corner too. He comes in and um, he starts listing off like how many home runs he had, how many RBIs he had, how many things. And he, he, I seem, I can hear him getting closer and closer to me. And he turned and he said, so I have all these credits. Who the blank are you? And then right then Mark walked in, he goes, that's my roommate, Dan. And then uh, I, I kind of, Mark, um, our house was like a party house. And you got to remember that in the 90s at that time, you had all the, you know, Bulls championships. Yep. Chelios and all those guys Ronick. were in their prime. You know, the Blackhawks and we went to Stanley Cup. It was Ronick, Pittsburgh. 92. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So all those guys used to crash at our house. Frank Thomas. All those guys. Yeah. And um, <laughs> uh, not so I mean, much Frank Thomas. No. No. I got a good Frank Thomas Gracie story, though. Um, 
So uh, all those guys used to crash our house. So our house was legendary. It, Brian McRae got traded the Mets in like the 98 or something. I, I think it was around there. And so the next year he said, hey, why don't you come to, because Brian McRae is one of my favorite uh, Mark players and we hung out all the time and we're still friends. And he said, why don't you come to um, New York? And the, the night before there's a cop benefit where the Yankees and the Mets get together. And then the next, then we got th three games. So come. And so I did. And then he was, uh, um, he was doing some television too and he wanted a little help with that. So I did. So I'm kind of in this, uh, all, it's all players and owners. It's a private event. And on the other side of the room are Derek Jeter and um, um, the pitcher. Andy Pettit? Uh, Lighter, L. Lighter. Lighter. Okay. And they're pointing at me and I'm thinking, they're pointing at me like, it's one of those, why is this guy here? Who is this guy? And they're pointing at me, they start making his way over and BMAC had went to go to drink or something. And uh, they're like, I wanna talk to you, I wanna talk to you. And I'm like, you know, I don't even know you. And he goes, you're Gracie's roommate. You are a legend. <laughs> and then Jeter and Al Leiter went through a list of questions they had about celebrities that Mark dated, actresses, and just other things that had happened, like if they were true or not. 99.9% .9 of them were true. But, you know, there were... Some Gracie were. was a legend, man. He was a legend. And, and he I lived feel here like in the wintertime. No, never went home. He lived straight through. Yep, he lived straight through. He'd be on the L. He'd come down. And then the worst part was he'd come down to WGN every day at the 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. He goes, what are you doing? You want to go to lunch? I go, dude, I can't just leave right now. I'm working. And so I, I'd stick him in with Kathy and Judy, or uh, <laughs> the, which were the midday women that were on our station. Well, we got to get into all that. Hey, now we're from our sponsor, BetterHelp. So I think everybody's been in a situation where you're just looking to talk about the problems, but you're not looking at the solutions. I think better can help better help can really help people factor in here to help you finding that solution because it could be tough to train your brain to stay in problem solving mode when faced with the challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. Um, I always recommend therapy for people who are looking to talk to someone because uh, you know, it's not easy. You know, you might think, oh, what's this person going to think? What's that person going to think? Uh, this is a totally judge-free, uh, judgment-free situation, judgment-free service here that can really get you on the right track to feeling better and help you find those solutions. So uh, can't recommend it enough. If you even are even thinking about something that may need fixing, look no further than BetterHelp because uh, if you're thinking about giving therapy a try, it's a great option. It's convenient, it's accessible, it's affordable, and it's entirely online. You get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists at any time if you don't like it. So when you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash walk today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash walk. Go check it out. Let's get back into the episode. All right, but we got to start at how this even started. Like we got to get into how it all started. Like how did you and Grace begin to become roommates? Okay. Um, Steve and Gary, when we were on WLSM, we used to do massive concerts around the Midwest. And Peoria was one of our huge um, places to, we sold out like uh, huge theaters and stuff in Peoria. And when I was about to make the decision about whether I was going to leave or not and stay at WLS, I was down there. I had gone down there uh, to work on a project and I'm, you know, contemplating this. And it was a long, it had been a long night with Steve. It was just like, you know, three o'clock in the morning and, you know, he had some issues and I, I just, I needed a drink. Yeah. So the guy... The, so the bar wasn't open at the hotel, but the guy saw that I was, I needed just a glass of wine. And uh, he goes, I'll even turn the TV on for you. And so he turned the TV on and I'm watching a replay of a sporting event. And Pete Van Aken is getting interviewed. And I, if I remember it right, Pete had suspended Mark Grace, a guy that I'd never heard his name, um, for a game, but then unsuspended him and then Mark won the game over 
I guess Mark snuck out of this baseball stadium and uh, met a girl and couldn't get back in the same way he got out. And so Pete was upset about it. And so the two of them are on and I am laughing my ass off. So when I went to WGN, the, I said, they, they said, what was, what's the first thing that you would do? I said, well, your WGN cub is Ryan Sandberg. He doesn't talk. I go, there's this kid down on Peoria that I saw that I go, if he ever gets called up, you should hire him. And so, you know, our old, uh, my old, uh, my bought my big boss, Dan Fabian said, eh, yeah, well, we'll think about that or whatever. And then the, the program director said, we're not going to hire somebody. We don't know if he's going to make the team or not. And so Mark made the team. And then I went back to him. I said, hey, that, that kid made the team. Well, you know, we're really good. You know, Rhino's great, uh, whatever. And then I said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll, you guys gave me a bonus to come here. I'll take that money. He's a rookie. I'll call up his agent and see if there's any interest. And the interest was Barry, uh, I called up the agent, Barry Axelrod. And he said, yeah, there's interest. And um, so I used my bonus and I said, but if, Mark is makes the team and he has a really good year. You guys have to not only give me this money back, but then I get a piece of his next deal. You know, if we resign him and they're like, okay, done deal. And then as it turns out, our boss did, you know, Mark had that amazing rookie of the year season. And um, so I had never met Mark and he had been on the station for, four or five months. It was, I was always back at the station for the ball games and stuff like that. And times when he came in to the overnight guy show or Bob Collins, I wasn't around. So at the Christmas party, he and his wife came and he said, are you the guy that said to hire me? And I said, yeah. And I told him this story. He starts laughing. He goes, my wife and I don't know anybody here. Do you, you want to hang out? And I had had five or six years of celebrities and the 85 bears and um and i i was just burned out i just wanted to stay home for a while yeah. you know or go to a movie and i was yeah okay okay and so mark's wife and the girl that i was dating at the time and they kind of hit it off and they started talking and then every once in a while we get together for dinner we went to lowry's and mark was so young then and he goes listen before we walk in he said listen um because of playing baseball a lot of people are going to bug us and i hope you guys don't mind you know mark didn't know that much about me he didn't know that i was around stephen gary when thousands of people would be you know rushing the stage or around harry Shearer, john blue or dan Aykroyd. yeah so uh we i just thought it was like the most sincere thing, you know, the kindest thing you could say. And we're at Lowry's chef Hans, the legendary chef Hans was the chef there who went to the Blackhawks after that. And, um, these three guys started to walk toward our table and Mark kind of pushed his chair back. goes, sorry guys, here it comes. He goes, does anybody have a pen? So I happened to have a pen in my bag. So I went to go around my bag and, uh, the guy goes, are you Dan Filato, Stephen Gary Dan Filato? Mark, we just, the three of us started laughing, or four of us actually started laughing our asses off. I go, yeah, can we have your autograph? Can we take a picture? And I'm like, oh God. Yeah. And Mark's, and I'm like, and I'm doing this with my eyes to get him to recognize Mark. They didn't recognize Mark. Uh -huh. And so um, Mark's wife went to Los Angeles to become an actress and they bought a house out there. And then the next year he kept on locking himself out of the house. And so... He said, hey, can I give you an extra key? Because I was near his place. And uh, I said, yeah, sure. And it turns out that he, had, he would lock himself out like two, three times a week. And so he said, hey, would you ever think about living together? Like I knew you, and I was moving closer to downtown because WGM wanted me to be there closer for rain delays. So I was moving closer to, from where I lived at the time. And uh, I was like, no, I'd, no, I'd not, rather not do that. So he goes, listen, I'm going to, I have to go. Uh, he, that was the year, one of the years that Mark went um, down to, uh, to bulk up uh, to, to try and hit more home runs and stuff. And it changed his wrist. So he didn't do that anymore. But he goes, hey, can you, uh, you're 
uh, lease is done. Do you want to just stay at my house for like a month, a month and a half while, you know, you get to your new place? And I'm like, okay, sure. And then he said, then he, he was hoping that that would happen. And then he came back like the second or third day and he flew and he goes, hey, we'll just live together. Let's just try. I hate living alone. Just live together. I'm like, all right, we'll try it. And then 10 years <laughs> later, we were still living together. Then when you Mark went to- for 10 years? 10 years. <laughs> then when Mark went to uh, the Diamondbacks, um, I come home one day. Now, uh, Mark, my nickname for Mark was Mr. Tell It Like It Ain't. He mm -hmm. would tell girls whatever they wanted to hear. And there were a lot of them that thought that they were, after one or two dates, they were going to be the next Mrs. Grace and they would send their clothes in boxes and stuff to the house. So we would get that all the time. And so I come home one day and there's giant boxes of clothes and I'm looking around, there's no name on or whatever. So I, so I open one of the boxes and it's a guy's clothes. So I get a hold of Gracie and, um, I, I called and left a message and he never called me back, which was, you know, which was the norm. And then I went out to dinner and I come back and Carrie Woods in my apartment. I go, what are you doing here? He goes, wait, Mark didn't tell you. I go, no. He goes, he said you were lonely so that I was looking for a place and he goes, just move in with Dan. So he, I go, no. And so Carrie would live with me for a year and a half. And then I could not do that anymore. I just couldn't. Uh, and I had been, I had met this girl that I was interested in. And so Carrie lived with me for a year and a half. And then for about three weeks, Matt Clement lived with me when he was a pitcher with the Cubs. And then, cause we had the same agent and then uh, he went, but he went to Boston. So, and then that was it. That was. That's unreal. And, yeah. and, and you're right though. People don't, and at least from my vantage point being, you know, Barstool's we're Barstool Chicago. We know Mark Grace. We know how much of a legend he is. But I feel like nationally, now that it's been years, some people kind of forgot. Yeah. You know, he didn't do a lot of things to help himself. Yeah. You know, Fox true. Sports wanted him to be the color guy on their yeah. national stuff. And this was, you know, this was before the problems that he had in, um, uh, in Arizona. Mm -hmm. But he just didn't, you know, um, it's... It, he needed somebody to push him. Like when he would do shows in Chicago, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I would write stuff for him or little things that he'd get into and, and he just needed somebody to push him and, Keep um, going. yeah. And his, you know, um, his wife, he had a wife for a short period of time. She didn't like me so much cause she knew, no. you know, th there were a lot of other women when he was dating her and, you know, but I just kind of stayed out of that. So and my favorite fun fact about Mark Grace is he has the most hits in the nineties. Yep. Lot that's a yep. that's a great trivia question. Yep. Here, hold on for one second. Yeah, good. So I brought this. Um the most hits in that decade. This is the glove and the ball that Mark uh caught for the nineteen ninety eight playoff game. So Joe Carter's hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the glove and the ball. And um, they, they made the playoffs. And Mark and I had this secret word that if, and he would be in a, uh, like a stadium with 50,000 people. And if I yelled this word, he knew either to call me or text, uh, not text, um, page me. Page me or we, he had to look for me. And I, same thing with me. You know, if I, if he, I, if I, if I, on the, on the ball field, if he yelled the secret word, I would normally hear it up in the booth with Ron, uh, and first at Tom Brenneman and then Pat Hughes. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, um, we had the secret word and after the catch and on the field, I see him yelling the secret word. I am in a box with Michael Jordan, Jim McMahon, Dan Hampton, Chris Chelios. <laughs> And uh, D.B. Sweeney. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm in this, and so he comes down, and I had a I had a backpack on me at all time, all the time, and he shoves the glove in my backpack and said, and the ball, and he said, I put a lot on you this year. This is for you, and he goes, I'll be really Major League Baseball is looking for it. I'll be pissed if you give it up. I'll be really mad, and so they went back and looked at the camera footage and then asked the Cubs who that guy was. 
And he says, well, he works at WGN. Well, and they kept everybody. That night, I went from bar to bar to bar with uh, Bill Murray, um, Dave Kaplan from from mm-hmm. uh, ESPN 1000, yep. who uh, I was instrumental in hiring a GN. And then my friend, Brian Cummings and his wife, Mary. Brian was an amazing pitcher at Northwestern. Um, and then I think played in Baltimore for a while. And uh, he was one of my interns at, at WGN. And we went up and down and Major League Baseball was looking for us for that glove and the ball. And then I guess Yosh made up some excuse and whatever's in the Hall of Fame isn't the ball in the mitt. And Mark signed that for me. There's, I can't show you the thing he signed, but... Um, it, he signed that for me. He goes, this is for you. It was a rough year. I mean, it, it what was, does, what does that mean? What does a rough year entail? There were a lot of, of, uh, upset <laughs> ex Mrs. Mark races around at the most I had ever seen. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was just, and you have to remember that, you know, the, the Cubs were doing well then, yeah. you know, and, uh, they seemed to be on a roll and they became this huge story. All these, um, all, all these sports, national sports guys, the broadcasters would come in and, um, uh, and, and like pal around with Mark because you had Sammy on that team that really didn't pal around with anybody. Uh, who else? Like Gary Gaetti, mm-hmm. uh, Mickey Morandini. Um, yeah, what, Kevin, What's his name? Uh, Who's the guy that hit the fucking ball? Uh, he was on the team, right? Who hit it in the uh, the the rooftop? Oh, Glenn Allen Hill, yes, Glenn one Allen of my Hill. favorite players uh-huh. of all time. Yeah. So, um, uh, so you know, all Mark and you know the Bulls were there. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jordan, Jordan loved Grace, and uh, you know we we run out. Of, you got to remember, there's not a lot of places to go here, so we run in the Bulls all the time, especially because Mark stayed here for the winter, and. Um, so Bulls, Hawks, we hung out with Chelios a lot. Yeah. So um, what, um, I mean. I have a great story, Frank Thomas story for you. Yeah, yeah let's do Okay, that. so uh, Frank, the White Sox called, was one of the Cubs Sox games. White Sox called and said to Mark, hey, listen, can you come down a couple hours early? We want to do a couple shots with you and Frank. Um, and Mark goes, yeah, sure. He goes, but the team bus isn't leaving until, he goes, we'll give you a, a, a spot in the player's lot. So Mark goes, great. He goes, do you want to go with me? I'm like, yeah, sure. So we, I drove down there because I was producing the game for GN. And we got to the ballpark and they parked this car. Uh, Mark was one of the first people in there. And they did the photo shoot. It's Frank and Mark, like gold. I can't remember what it was. but it's, And it's a pretty well-known picture. So um, the Cubs win the game. And uh, we're, we were c- kind of friends with Robin Ventura. And Robin said, where are you guys going? And we figured out a place to go or whatever. And so we're all walking out to the parking lot together. And Frank is there. And so we're all talking. And Frank goes, I don't know if I'm going to go. Um, so, uh, you know, you guys have fun or whatever. And so there's the, a fence there. And there are thousands of White Sox fans. Gracie, Gracie, sign autographs, sign autographs. Please, please, Gracie, you're our favorite Cub, even though we hate the Cubs. Grace, we love you. Gracie, come on, Gracie. Grace. So Mark goes, I'm going to sign some autographs for the people out there. And he starts to walk there. And Frank was talking to somebody else. And he grabs him by the shoulder. He goes, hey, man, I wouldn't do that if I were him. I go, why? He goes, I'm, trust me, I wouldn't do that if I, if I were him. Those people are animals. And I'm like, okay. So I kind of jog out to where, because Mark's car was the farthest car. So I kind of jog out and I go, Gracie, Frank doesn't think, you know, and they had a nice rivalry going. Doesn't think this is the best idea for you to do this. And Frank and Mark goes, whatever, okay. You know, and they would gotten into a lot of discussions about Frank saying, why is he more popular than me? You know, Mm -hmm. and it was all, you know, good nature. Yeah. And so Mark gets about three quarters of the way to to the fence to where there's no going back. And all of a sudden, bottles, cans, Grace, you suck. Great. Every, the worst things you could hear or whatever. And Frank just looks at me and goes, I told you, those people are animals. Mark's like running back, like, what happened? What happened? Uh, There were a couple of dents in the car. They duped them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was hilarious. (laughs) They got to respect that out of the Sox fans. Yeah. That's unreal. (laughs) And and like, I mean, how how many, how many a week do you think? How many girls was he pulling? Uh, 
It, it was a lot. <laughs> it was, and it was. Uh, but he's putting up Will Chamberlain numbers. Not that much, yeah. but uh, in the off season, he had a great time. Let's just say that. Yeah. You know, he would go to. Uh, you know, we lived uh, near DePaul, so he would he would go to Starbucks and sit the Starbucks at Sheffield and Diversity. Mm-hmm. He would go sit there, you know. And there's a gym right across the street where a lot of what is it Lakeview Gym? Yeah, my uh, girlfriend at the time w- had gone there. It was like a, a the young girls thing, and Mark would just sit there drinking coffee, and all of a sudden, you know. And then he would do these. Um, uh, tr- sportsmen's trips and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of them, you know, <laughs> there was a, especially like St. Louis or Atlanta, the ones with the best um, gentlemen's clubs. He, you know, all of a sudden I'd come in uh, from work Monday afternoon and there'd be three women in the living room. <laughs> so, you know, it was, uh, it, it was interesting. It's wild. It, was like, it, it was like the Playboy Mansion. That's the way I describe it. Yeah. And it, not only with the women, but the celebrities. I mean, one day I'd come home and Robert De Niro would be in our living room. When you know Robert De Niro was in her living yeah, room. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, there'd be messages from Madonna when she was doing League of Their Own. Fell in love with Mark. She saw a poster of him at Wrigley Field and kept on calling. He wouldn't go out with her. Um, uh, and that's how she met Rodman. She saw. Uh, uh, Rodman said that th- that's the reason how they met was some, you, some Grace's name came up and and um, that's how the two of them started to go out. Wow. Uh, but he, you know, and especially, you know, he'd be on the subway. He'd take the subway in the off season. You know, uh, if he'd come downtown, we'd go to dinner or something. And it, I, I actually, you know, I liked it for a while. And, but then when he was like hanging out at work all the time and he was playing office ball with Tom Waddle and Mark Silverman and Dave yeah, Kaplan yeah. for hours and hours and hours, yeah. you know, and I'd be like, okay, Cap, we got to talk about the show or whatever. Just, okay, just this last game, last game. And how do you, you know, and they're like, we'll just have Mark on. And then Mark would go on. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it was just. Why did he stay in the winter? He just wanted to be. He liked being here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was. In you know he he liked being here so yeah. um, it was fun it was it was you know November then he'd go on the Nike trip you know for like two weeks uh, yeah. he was a Nike athlete and then he'd come back and go see his parents around Christmas time but um, uh, that but he pretty much stayed here the entire winter and surprised he ever moved you know uh, we would go we went to Jordan's house once and you had to have a key card. And I, I, I'm not going to wear a key card. You yeah. know, yeah. And I just. This and, is that Highland Park one? Yeah. Okay. And um, it was unbelievable to be in there. It's It was. And the only time we ever thought about it was Chicago Magazine had a thing like where celebrities live. And on one page, they had Michael Jordan's college, basically. I mean, it looked like a college. And then our little house our little three flat and uh, mark mark was looking he goes dude this is embarrassing i make seven million dollars a year we gotta get a new house and then we started we looked a, you know a couple of times and then we're like no we like our house the way it is it was you know it was out of the way and you had all three floors yeah we had okay. all three floors yeah it, i was on the third floor um, Mark was on the second floor and then we had a, a laundry room and then a pool table and the first floor was like community. And you know, there'd be weeks where I didn't see him for a you know, long period of time. He'd be out or, you know, I had to get up and go to work a lot. So where's this place at? Uh, we were at Halston Diversity. Halston Diversity. That yeah. should be enshrined. Yeah. So it was, and Rana P. He doesn't you know, own it anymore. Rana the Hidden People Shamrock was there. Yeah. Uh, Harrington's. Dirk. Uh, what's the other bar that's around the Durkins? Is it Durkin? Yeah, Durkin. Durkins. Yeah, Durkins. Yeah. So, you know, if and, Mark was ever lonely, you know, or else the girl from Walgreens across the street, you know. <laughs> so it's, and he doesn't own it anymore, right? What? He doesn't own it. No, that. no. Yeah, no? we sold it. That place should be, you know, it yeah. should be as historic as Walt Disney's house. As, as the Playboy <laughs> Mansion, for sure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was just, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was fun. And, you know, I had some celebrity friends and he'd be shocked that, you know, these people would be in our living room or yeah. rock stars. And, you know, I met a lot of people, you know, Joe Walsh crashed on our couch once and mm-hmm. uh, Mark just stared at him and goes, that's Joe Walsh, <laughs> James Gang, Eagles, you know, he goes, that's, you know, so we would do that. I got to meet Sinatra twice because he was a huge fan. 
he would watch the Cubs on a satellite dish in California. Really? And um, yeah, so we, we got invited two times out to his house. One time I went with Ron Sano, and then another time I went with Gracie. That's, that's amazing, man. And was it like, uh, yeah, I don't know. That, that, that's so many fucking cool people. And I, you know, I got to talk to Sinatra about the, what I told you in the text. Um, uh, you know, the story that I told you in the text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Steve and Gary, we, 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 when we were on WLS, we had this huge, I mean, we were getting 20,000 people to a show. And uh, if we would do a live shows and that's where Steve wasn't making a lot of money at WLS. So that's where we were making a lot of our money. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, the snuggeries, remember that bar where you, you're not old enough, the snuggeries. There's and, one in, there was one in Edison park. But oh yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, there was a chain of that and they had this thing called snug fest and they asked Stephen Gary to host it. And it was for $20, you got all the bar you could have and all the beer you could drink. And they had some bands there too. So we got there, Stephen, we're gonna host it. And they, they, we got there and um, there was this huge a double trailer uh, that everybody was in partying and stuff. And it, it just wasn't my deal. So I walked outside until Stephen Gary had to go on the stage. And I wanna make sure the microphones were okay. And there's a guy in a, in a limousine and he's watching the end of a Cubs game. And, uh, cause it was summertime. And he's like, he, he, he rolls down the window, he goes, you want, he, I could see the game a little bit. He goes, come on in, sit down, watch the game. So we started talking, he goes, you're with those uh, disco, anti-disco guys, right? He goes, yeah, he goes, uh, I kind of like disco music. And uh, I'm like, okay, sorry about that or whatever. And he was cordial and fun. And then Steve came out of the trailer and the door was open. And he saw us in this limousine and we're watching the Cubs game. And um, so he, I introduced Steve to this guy and he said, his name is uh, Anthony. And um, so we're, we're talking and then he said, okay, so here's everything that's gonna happen in the ninth inning. The Cubs are gonna score two runs, but they're not gonna win. And so ninth inning, that's exactly what happened. And, it, and so, when the final out happened and he went to push the TV off, we saw the gun in his, uh, on his side. And so Steve, and then between that and the fact that he told us what was going to happen in that game, we're like, we got to get out of here. So we got out. It, it was cordial. Everything was great. Steve and Gary did their thing. We left. Um, so nothing happened. A year and a half later, I get to work and on the front page of the Tribune, I'm looking at this picture. I'm like, man, where do I know this guy from? And then I realized it was the guy in the limousine and he had given me his card with a cell phone, the cell phone, with a private phone on there if we ever came to Vegas because he knew Stephen Gary were a big deal. And so that is Tony Spilatro mm -hmm. and um, he was killed. And so um, Steve had, I have the card, I have it framed, and it was in my house with Mark Grace, and Mark Grace would always go buy it. In this, to go from the first floor to the second floor, you had to go buy my, Mark made me put up some stuff from my past, because he goes, it looks like a Mark Grace museum in here. Yeah. And he goes, you know, to some of the ladies, I look kind of desperate, yeah. so put up some of your stuff. So I had, you know, great stuff, uh, pictures with me, uh, on the set of Spinal Tap or working with Ari Shear or with D Danny and John. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I had the card that I, and I, after he was killed, I got it framed. Years later, about five years ago, Artie Lang and I are walking. Um, well, first of all, Mark and I go to see Casino and he knew the story. Mm -hmm. And um, Mark goes, there is no possible way that that could have happened, that they would have thrown that game. Because the pitcher would have to be, and we t we talked about it a lot. And then, you know, then Casino came to uh, Cable, and Mark would see Casino all the time. And, um, and then he said, you know, one time he said, you know, it was the end of the season, and this was obviously way before he was on the Cubs. It was 15 years later, maybe, you know, maybe it could have happened. 
So Artie Lang and I were walking through Union Square and we run into Martin Scorsese and he knew Artie and started talking. This is my friend Dan, my producer Dan from Chicago. And uh, we started talking and I was trying to, oh, well, we do a podcast. I, we'd love to get you on. He goes, yeah. You know, and, and so he goes, Dan, tell him the story. And so I told Scorsese the story. He goes, holy cow. That, you know, that's not what he said, but he said, wow. If I had known that, Casino would have been different. I go, yeah, I go, I, I wish I could say, and you know, knowing Mark, knowing the insides of, of baseball, and obviously, you know, I was with Mark w when Belcor pitched him on steroids. It, there were like 10 players there. I was the only non-player, and he said, well, Dan's gotta come with me um, because uh, um, we were doing something afterward, and he just wanted me to listen to it. He goes, oh, it's all natural. They were telling him, it's all natural, don't worry about it, and Mark was like, no, no chance. No chance. Um, the very first thing that you know I said was ask if there are any side effects, and you know, do uh, they test for it? And um, he said, well, you know, it can make like your testicle smaller. And Mark goes, are you insane? <laughs> are you out of your mind? And then Mark just left, yeah. and uh, all the other players at that dinner were our steroid ruined. steroid guys. Yep. Mark was the only one. He goes, it's cheating the game. I won't do it. I won't do it. He refused. Yep. So what did Scorsese say he'd make different? He would just put He the, would have the, made the, the base. Thing? Yeah, the baseball. He goes, that's a whole other aspect that Frank Rosenthal had never told him. Yeah. And um, and I told, we had had Frank on one of Artie's podcasts, maybe, or maybe DirecTV. And Artie made him hold on so I could tell him that story. He goes, wow. He goes, I didn't even think, he goes, that might be something I had not never heard before. So, really? um, and I still have the card and I still have the, the phone number to call on the back. That's it awesome. It says uh, Anthony Spilatro. Uh, and then it's, he has some fake name, you know, like a uh, concessions director. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. So for people that don't know, that's Nikki Santoro in, in Casino. Casino, yeah, in the movie uh -huh. Casino. Yeah. Now, now uh, I, I would love to see a picture of that. You got to send me. Yeah, that. I've got it's, it. It's in, uh, I've got a storage area with a whole bunch of stuff that, uh, you know, cause I had, a lot of stuff from Mark, a lot of stuff from me. And so I, I, I just don't, and it's, you know, if you start putting up all over the walls, it's kind of like, uh, yeah. you know, it, hey, look at me, look at me. Yeah, Anna. yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. Um, now, what did Jeter and Lighter, what was something they asked? Okay. I know you're I trying to think to, about what you could say. Uh, what I could say. Because <laughs> you said okay. that. There, this is a, I, I'm going to take up all your time here. This is a long story. Okay. I mean, well, we, I still want to get into Artie for sure. Okay. Okay. Oh, well. okay. So, um, there was a, a benefit at Harry Carey's and it, I don't remember what it was for. And they asked WG and radio to do a show from there. So it was Dave Kaplan, Tom Waddle and a uh, Glenn Kozlowski. We did, a, we did a show from there. It was a nighttime show, and it was to promote the charity. It was the Cubs' wife's charity. And um, Mark was a little bit late, and he, he walked in, and it was all Cubs and Cubs' wives, but no single women. So um, before he had walked in, I, I was standing next to a very famous sports broadcaster, female, that said... Oh my God, there's Mark Grace. He is, this is a quote, he is the biggest whore in baseball I've heard. He's just such a sleaze bag. So Mark walks in, he walks over to us, uh, he sits down and does like a half hour. Now Mark was gonna be um, MC of the show. And um, he, he, walks over to, he walks over to us, he does his part or whatever, he goes, Man, Dan, there's there are no tens here. I'm telling you, they're you know they're all wise, or whatever. And he goes, well, you know, except for that person. I go, dude, you ain't got a chance. And Cap, Dave Kaplan said the same thing. Mark, she hates you. You you don't have a chance. So there was a a bidding thing, uh, auction. Mark's hosting it, laughing, blah blah blah. Then afterward, we have to record like a 15 minute like wrap up for the next day. And so we're doing the 15 minute wrap up. We had a friend that was uh, the, he used to be the chef of the 49ers. So Mark bought him this Jerry Rice jersey for like, you know, $10,000, whatever, autographed jersey. 
And so um, I'm looking around, we're, we're wrapping up, we're packing up the equipment. I'm looking around, I go, where's Mark, where's Mark? And Mark called me Rumi. Uh, and there's only two people that call me Rumi, Mark and Michael Jordan. So um, he'd yell, he yelled, right. Rumi, Rumi. And I could see, and I've, I have measured it, so it's about 50 feet. Um, so I, as I turn to look where he's calling me, he didn't use our secret word, because he wouldn't, because Cap had found out about it, and he didn't want Cap knowing what the secret word was. So as I turn, the jersey, 50 feet away, he got it so it hit me right in the face. And he, he goes, take care of that for me, bro. And as I take the jersey down, I see him walking out with this female broadcaster hand in hand. The next day, she gets up six o'clock in the morning to work out. Um, Mark wasn't getting up six o'clock in the morning, but I didn't like people being in our house. They could, and certainly she wouldn't have done this, but I just got up early and, um, and so I'm down there making coffee and I said to this woman, would you like some coffee? And she goes, no, I'm going to the gym. Mark said, I can borrow your car. Is that okay? And I'm like, sure. So she borrows my car. She goes, can I need your phone? She calls ESPN and leaves a voicemail for her boss. Mark, Grace, and I are in love. We're going to be in a serious relationship. You have to take me off the Cubs beat. And so um, she left. And so I, I, I'm not going into work that day because I, I have to see the look on Mark's face when I come down and tell him what just happened. And he comes down and he goes, Whew, man, <laughs> thank goodness. Uh, is she gone? I go, yeah. I go, okay. I go, uh, so... This happened. He goes, yeah, oh, yeah, right. He goes, I'm telling you, it happened. And um, he goes, um, no way, no. I go, Mark, go on our phone and look at the time and look at the phone number in uh, Bristol, Connecticut. And he's like, oh, my God, are you serious? He goes, dude, I never, ever want to see her again, ever, ever. And so, <laughs> so um, it, he gets the phone number changed again. Um, uh, around 19, we didn't have the phone in our name. We had five phone lines in our house for two guys. We had Mark's line. We had my line. We had the chump line that we gave like reporters and stuff like that. Yeah. Then we had a fax line. And then we had a, a line that, because when Mark had a girl there, he would turn off all the ringers. He, we had a phone that only I and his mother knew the number. And he could never turn off the ringer because I broke the little thing on it. And so, um, so we had five lines. We get a call. We get a letter from the FBI. They want to talk to us uh, saying, listen, uh, we want you to come down to the office. And it's in both our name. Uh, it's, no, it's in the name of our, our, our uh, we know that there's two guys living there. We need you to come down. And uh, so we do. And we're freaking out because we're trying to think, is it an ex-girlfriend of his? Is it somebody that I, you know, uh, knew from show business? Something we didn't know. And the fact that they wanted to see both of us was a real problem. We were freaking out. So we went down to their office. We opened the door. And the FBI guy goes, now it makes sense. You're Mark Grace. And he goes, yeah. He goes, well, you don't have your name on the phone bill. He goes, we thought you were drug dealers. And we're like, why? He goes, who gets their phone number changed 37 times in a calendar year? 37. Why would you get your number changed so much? You can't be that big of a celebrity. He goes, I don't like to break up with girls. <laughs> and the FBI just laughed their asses off because they thought we were drug dealers. And we have the record for the most, uh, on one single phone line, the most number changes <laughs> in Illinois Bell history. He was the original ghoster. Right. Huh? He would just ghost these exactly. girls. He didn't break up with them. He just changed the phone number. But what the problem up, was, though? the problem was is that then they would show up to WGN yeah. at the showcase studio and they'd be outside, girls crying, you know, why doesn't Mark love me? But whatever. Mark Grace, what a dog. So <laughs> um about a so uh Mark what Mark didn't plan on was this woman being able to get into every locker room he's gonna get in. So he's like, I got to figure something out. So 
he goes down to Atlanta. He gets caught on purpose. And, I, you know, I love Mark to death, but they all come back. So a couple months later, they run into each other. He does the, you know, it's, it's my commitment thing, blah, 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 blah. And so I, I walk into the house from riding my bike to GN and I'm putting my bike and I see this woman. And I said, hey, listen, um, I go, hi, what are you doing here, whatever? You're not going to believe it. You know, Mark and I had a long talk and we're getting back together. And so we go, we had a really small kitchen, um, about a quarter the size of this, your studio here. And this woman cannot see Mark. So she's looking at me, she's talking to me. Mark's where you are. And she can't see Mark. And Mark, hold on for one second. Mark goes, um, she goes, so Mark said that it's his reason with his commitment because his ex-wife and blah, blah, blah. And DM, what do you think? What do you think? And, and I'm just looking at Mark and he's going. <laughs> and I go, I think you two are made for each other. <laughs> and he starts giving me the finger or whatever. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. And three days later, he, he gets busted again. And, oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, that, was, that was the number one story they wanted to know about. Um, then there was a, an actress, another actress. So that, this girl, you, you won't say her name, no. but I assume she's very, very famous? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. And there were a lot of, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's unreal. That's unreal. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah you know we're i mean you're just gonna have to keep coming you might have a weekly appearance oh, right? you might be well i can't rent. afford the pizzas every time <laughs> no it's okay <laughs> uh no pizzas needed we should be i should be buying you pizza um so then let's uh for this this week's sake let's talk uh let's get into Artie then okay because Artie's Artie's my guy right you know he's um we got i got hired uh, by DirecTV to, I didn't want to, I was actually going to London. I had committed to something and working on this project. Cause I, I like doing comedy too. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really a good, uh, um, uh, punchline writer, but I can get a premise going with yeah. writers and stuff like that. And uh -huh. so DirecTV called me and they said, and two people that are really important in my life, um, Trevor Oliver and Drew Hayes said, please just talk to the guy from DirecTV. This is right up your alley. And I said, they wouldn't tell, they said, Nick DiPaolo and another guy are doing this show and we want you to produce it. And so I said, um, I, I said, it was interested. And they kept on up in the money and up in the money and up in the money. And I was like, okay, well, let me meet. I knew Nick and I weren't going to get along. He's really right wing. And um, I have a, I, uh, oh crap, I can't say it on this. Um, I, I don't, it, Boston is one of the least favorite cities for me to go to. Okay. They're just, they're so mean. <laughs> they're mean people <laughs> everywhere, okay. whether, whether it be at Starbucks or at the hotel. Yeah, okay. You know, so, um, so I did the interview. There were like 20 other producers there and I was the very first one. It was my birthday. Uh, Bill Murray was coming to pick me up for my birthday and we were gonna go watch the Bears had a special like Thursday night game and we were going to this restaurant to watch the game. And so a minute into the interview that lasted about 30 minutes, Artie walks out. I'm sitting there like, you fat, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know, rehab, you know, and uh, to, thinking to myself and Nick's grilling me, hey, so you're a Obama lover, you love Obama, you know, no, but you know, it's just all about politics and you know, that I was from Chicago and he hated Chicago and blah, 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 blah. And then Artie comes back in for like the last couple of minutes. I thought maybe he went to smoke or something, but I thought it was disrespectful. And then um, the, all the direct type TV guys were, were there. They were listening to another studio, which I didn't know. And then uh, I walk out and I, well, I, I'm standing with Artie and Nick and I shake their hand. And I said, thanks or whatever. And I, I walk out and um, the, I get in the elevator. I got the elevator like right away and I'm going downstairs and then um, Bill is signing an autograph on, you know, it's really hard to double park your car on sixth Avenue in front of Rockefeller center mm -hmm. where the interview was, except, except if you're Bill Murray. So the cops were letting him do that or whatever. And I was standing there and then all these direct TV guys are chasing me down along with Artie and Nick. And they're like, where are you going? Can you start tomorrow? And I go, wait a minute. Artie walked out. He goes, Artie walked out after a minute and said, you're my guy. 
this is my guy. This is the guy I want. Mm -hmm. So, um, and a, a lot of it was working with, he already so respected Harry Shearer that um, that was one of the main selling points. And then I still didn't want the job. And then they upped the money some more. And I'm like, okay, I, I got to... Uh, I got to do this because it was enough money to buy my house. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so I did it. And then, um, about three, Mar Artie was like, Hey, I'm doing the, Bur I got two shows at the Borgata. They're sold out. You wouldn't have to do anything. Just come and watch my act or whatever. And I go, well, I know who you are. I mean, you know, we didn't have a lot of Stern, but we did have it the last year or two. And he goes, well, just come, to, just come to the show. And so we, we finished the direct TV show. We're, in, we're going to the Borgata. It's a two and a half hour drive maybe from New York. And about, I never mentioned the Mark stuff. So about 10 minutes into the thing, uh, oh, Artie wanted to use my phone on his Bluetooth because I had better music on my phone. So he sees Mark Grace pop up and he puts him on speakerphone and, and Grace is like, Dano, and starts talking to me or whatever. And uh, I said, listen, I'm in a car. Can I call you tomorrow? He goes, yeah, just call me tomorrow because I got to get this number or whatever. And I said, okay. So Artie pulls the car over and he goes, who, who, who's Mark Grace? And I go, he's a, he's a baseball player. He goes, yeah. He's the guy that started the inning against the Yankees. Why is he calling in my car? I, I'm so mad, right? He's like, so mad i go and i forgot that mark single started you know even jeter makes fun of it jeter goes i was so close to it gracie man mm -hmm. gracie it just got right by me mm -hmm. and um and so we get then we got back in the car and we called mark back and there the two of them are had a long conversation it was a blast and uh that's ki kind of how we bonded and um uh it was uh we worked really well you know for a long time yeah, so then you do the Nick and Artie show, and then the Artie show. Right. Then then Nick had some issues, and then it was just the Artie show or whatever. And, um, you know, DirecTV kept on telling me that they were drug testing him once a month. So I never had, you know, and when people said, saw him falling asleep, his mom would call up and say, that's his diabetes, mm -hmm. which I never doubted because DirecTV was drug testing him. Yeah. And turns out they weren't. Yeah. And um, so he was kind of doing it all right. the way through. No, no, he no. wasn't. He was clean for a while. Yeah. yeah. And then somebody in a, he went to get cupcakes for some anniversary show and somebody offered him and in this cupcake place. Really? Yeah. And that's what kind of started. That it started it. Yeah. yeah that, that started it. Then the other thing is, is that AT&T, we were offered a deal and AT&T was buying DirecTV and they were worried about the show. They were worried about some of the content because the Chris Culliver thing, had just happened. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so they were, they, they were, they said, listen, we need to, um, make this more family friendly and there's no chance that that was going to happen. And Artie and I had talked about it and John Ritchie, who was also on the show, yeah. um, it, it was never going to happen. So, yeah. um, so that turned into the Artie quitter podcast. Yeah. Then, yeah. then Sirius XM wanted us to do afternoons on the Howard channel. And so they even like brought me in and had me pick out an office and then as it turned, and the guy who was, the two guys that were spearing the deal said that they talked to Howard and never did. Right. And then, so then that's when we came up with the podcast. And for a while there, I mean, we were making a lot of money on the podcast, like the most money I've ever made in my life. Right. So it was, we because we had a lot of people that were listening. And he's, a, from what I understand, a pretty generous guy too. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, he was... Uh, well, he was back then when he had money. Yeah. And then uh, he, um, but it was, it was, we got it from the subscriptions. So that was, was where like my salary six, came six from. Six bucks a month or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. So it, we were making, a, we were making a lot of money. And then that's where Judd Apatow heard Artie and we, we got offered the, him to host the Montreal Comedy Fest because all, all the comedians were fans of our, our podcast. And, um, the first thing John Apatow said to me was, um, is that Mark Ray story true about you chasing the girl down the street with that stole Mark's golden glove? I go, yeah. He goes, I had to pull off the road. I was laughing so hard. He goes, I, and I go, you listen to our podcast? And he goes, yeah. And that's why they called Artie in. And then Artie got the crashing. Which was a great show. Yeah. It was, I was perfect. Super disappointed when they canceled that. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, you know. And you were a writing consultant, right? Yep. That? Yeah. Yep. And because some of the stories that were happening with Artie and Pete, 
were were stories that happened with me and Mark Grace. Okay. I just helped the writers because Mark our, our, he would like write down some of your ideas, and then they knew it, and. They wanted the second year from what the producer told us to be Dan and Artie do the podcast and Pete's on the couch, Pete Holmes. And then I came to my niece's um, uh, confirmation in Chicago and that weekend Artie got arrested. And then we didn't know if he was going to jail or not because he had had arrest before direct TV. You know, he had the cop, he hit the cop in Los Angeles and, and so uh, they couldn't, that's why season two was kind of bad. But then season three, uh, season three, I said, then I knew what was going on. I said, you guys got to let him go to rehab. Got to, well, then the show's over if he does. And I oh, said, so he was instrumental in that getting canceled. Well, they, the, the, the chemistry just wasn't there with the other comedians that Pete had with Artie. Yeah. So, but then season three did happen and Artie was only in a couple of them, yeah. but he should have never been in. And I told them, I, I was adamant and i said i was going to be leaving um stephen a had called me about another project i said i'm going to be leaving and they said well if you leave you know and because i was going to be the i was going to be part of crashing and uh because i was going to be on every episode and then when that didn't happen and it wasn't their fault already got arrested yeah and i didn't even know about it so uh, until i got back so was it like constant like fishiness like you knew something was going on yeah at that point then it was with him but i you he wanted to come be clean so badly and i would huge hollywood friends would pull me aside uh or guys i didn't even know like james Kahn pulled Artie and i aside on the street in in um new york and he he pulled me aside after he goes the guy is so funny he's a genius some of my comedian friends that are our comedic geniuses said he's the quickest guy they've ever seen. Yeah. Ever seen. Like just for a joke. And uh, that's pretty high praise from some of these guys. For sure. So. And I, I mean, I agree. I mean, and I'm a- he wanted to become clean. I tried to do it. There were a couple of times when I stopped him and it got physical. And then I was like, what am I doing? He's going to, he's going to kill me. Yeah. So then it was, you know, that was and it. he didn't mean, that's not the person that he was. Yeah, that's something that overtakes him. And, and I he's... couldn't be with him, and I couldn't be with him all the time, and it, it wasn't happening when I was there, um, but when I would go on, you know, but I wasn't there all the time, yeah. and I, w- I was never supposed to live with Artie. He was, his, his fiance had moved out like the month before, and then I was looking for an apartment, and he came with me. He goes, these are all crap. Why don't you come just stay with me for a couple months until we're on Sirius XM doing afternoons on the Howard channel. And then you can get an apartment after that. And so that's where, and then when none of that happened, um, and I was looking for an apartment, but then it, it, for, for, we were doing crashing, we were doing TV specials, we were doing uh, the podcast, we were doing so many other things that it just, there's no way I could have, been somewhere else unless I was in the same building yeah. and I couldn't afford that. So, yeah. Now, have, when was the last time you've talked to Artie? Um, last year I texted him and then he called. Um, I helped him out uh, financially with something and mm-hmm. hoping that he, he feels bad about it, but hoping yeah. I get paid. Now, do you know how he's doing now? I, I don't. I mean, I know that, um, It's, you know, he, I mean, he's clean. I think he's clean. I, I don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so an incident just happened within a couple of weeks that was because of Artie that, but it could have been one of his loser friends that did it, that, that it happened to me. Um, somebody tried to cash a check that uh, somebody had copied at Artie's apartment. So, um, but um, I, you know, I, I just don't believe it's really hard for me to believe anything that he says. So I don't know. I, I, I believe his mom is there with him. So she has his best interest in mind, obviously. And she tries to, you know, I don't know. I don't know what he does in his daily life. Because there was a, you see that video with him on the garbage truck. Yeah. That was, he looked good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you, and I don't know, you know, there was a lot of stuff that happened. Um, I, uh, when I was in Hoboken and um, New York, 
uh, you know, the show ended at two o'clock in the morning, the TV show, and there'd be a lot of cops out and a lot of them recognize Artie and we, I became friends with cops and like a lot of stuff happened uh, while he was supposed to be in jail that, you know, I, I don't, that a couple of cops said, hey, you know, he's going to be in there a little longer. He's going to be there a little longer because I was hoping to get the money back that I helped him out with. So. Yeah. Damn, man. I hope he, uh, I hope it is straightened out. I mean, yeah. So, so he's such a talent and so funny and such a good person, like in his heart, you know, whether yeah. that, the, the, you know, the drugs obviously change it. I, I don't have that in me. I, I, there's only a couple of people around me that, had that but you know uh when you have when you see what happened with john belushi and then you saw um that it's just not worth it mm -hmm. as and, and you know even with doll i was you know i was worried she was gonna it's not i, I wanted to like everything i busted my ass for first of all to keep the two of them together because they argued a lot mm -hmm. and 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 to get on uh and then when we went to wlsam and everything i mean we were huge i mean there was every springsteen would listen to our show and um and all the rock bands that came through they all said you gotta listen to Stephen gary you gotta listen to Stephen gary and um you know uh, um i i just think uh I, I'd been around it a lot and uh, I, I could tell, you know, if it was going to ruin somebody or not. And, you know, I did everything I could to get yeah. Artie to stop. Do you think him and Howard will ever resolve their relationship? I, I don't, I don't think so. No. I, I don't, um, you know, knowing how Dahl liked to avoid any of those type of situations, you know, whether there was, you know, to say maybe I shouldn't have done this or maybe I should have done that. Um, I, I just don't think, uh, I, from what I heard, Howard did try. So uh, whether he exploited it or not, I, I didn't hear a lot of it because we didn't have it here in Chicago yeah. for a long time. And then when we did, it was overnights and, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I, I don't think so. I just, from what everything that, um, and I've run into, him a couple of times and Howard yeah and yeah. and obviously uh, and Gary like uh will call me and ask me for something or th you know there are a couple of really high profile celebrity friends that I have that wouldn't go on Howard and I said to one of them yeah I mean you know maybe he should so um because he had changed a lot so yeah. um um so I I don't know I I think but I I do think that there is something, I mean, how bad could it have been working at Howard because they all complained and they all hated it. You know, when you, all the people that were around at the time, mm -hmm. uh, except for Gary, there, you know, you got uh, Shuli, that comedian, Shuley, and yeah. Stuttering John, who, yeah. you know, uh, I loaned money to and then uh, he started bad rapping me when I asked him to pay me back. Oh, really? uh, yeah. Artie had asked me to, and I go, I, oh, I don't want to do it. And he goes, come just do it. And he's going to pay you back at the end of the month. And then he didn't. And mm -hmm. we kept on calling him saying, Hey, where's that money? Well, Artie said I didn't have to pay back. And Artie goes, I never said that. Mm -hmm. So, but they all, this is all they talk about. And it's been what, 20 years. Yeah. I, I don't, what could it, something's going on, yeah. <laughs> some kind of weird thing that they all complain, they all, and you know, Artie, there were a lot of people that were in, the, there were 20 or 30 people that used to come over and they, that's all they did was talk about Howard, Howard this, Howard that. I'm like, yeah. my God. Yeah. It's crazy, man. It's, it, it is. And, and that's what, you know, you, he got into it a lot on the already quitter podcast. Yeah. I know. Uh -huh, yeah. So. And then he changed his mind on some of it that maybe, yeah. you know, Howard did try and, and, you know, do some things, but man, you know, I, I wasn't there, so I don't know. Yeah. You don't I just heard their side hand, of it. Yeah. Secondhand things. Yeah. Well, I hope Artie's all right. Yeah. That's all you can do. So do right? I. And, uh, it's just, he's so talented and so funny. Yeah. I mean, he used to make me laugh just, and just with a face. Uh, yeah. He would make me laugh, mm -hmm. uh, um, and very few people can do that. Yeah, now, I'm a I'm a am a tough 
uh, tough, uh, uh, tough customer. Critic. Yeah, <laughs> tough critic. I got you. Yeah. Sure. When you're around Bill Murray and Harry Shearer since you were 15 yeah. years old, you're, you're not going to laugh at, uh, you know, fart jokes. Yeah. No, that's a fact. That's a fact. Um, well, Dan, I think, you know, we're almost two hours now, I think. <laughs> wow. Like I said, I could we could keep going forever, but um, uh, respectful for your time. So thanks well, a thanks. lot for coming in, man. Thanks for inviting me. It was yeah, fun. Uh, no, yeah. We, we, I would love to have you again. So oh, yeah, see, absolutely. So. I'd, I'd, I'd love to come in. Awesome. Well, everybody, thanks for listening. Anything you got to plug? Anything going on? Uh, my my cat stroll uh, yeah. podcast. Yeah, go I, check that out. <laughs> I, yeah. I called him up. I go. Uh, I want to check. I want to promote my podcast. Cat stroll. Yeah. Goes, cat crawl. Oh, uh, cat. Yeah. The cat and crawl. I go. And, I, and he's like, uh, Oh, what is it or whatever? And I go, No, I'm joking. Isn't your thing dog walk? He goes, Oh, <laughs> yeah. I get it now. Went over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Yeah, because when people are like, I gotta no. promote something, I'm like, Yeah. And I know you're always doing rant. Like, didn't you do like the Chicago way for a while? You, you yeah. always got projects. Going yeah, on. yeah. It's like, All right, I guess Dan's. In the cats now he's uh, you know <laughs> he's with Lori lightfoot and the feral cats no 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 take care Wait, of our what's the chicago problem. way what do you i thought you did no what did you do the chicago uh you had a podcast the chicago something no and it was in your bio on twitter for a while the chicago it was a fake one oh that was fake? yeah it was a fake twitter account that everybody did on direct tv there's a filato gelato one <laughs> and right. there's, there's a couple of fake ones no well, it i didn't got me it yeah got me no 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 um, i had nothing with cats and dogs what are you up oh, to now is, is there anything? i just do like um some consulting for podcasts and stuff like that um i got paid uh i got this really awesome job uh to produce a podcast and uh, do like a little speaking tour with uh, a huge celebrity and then COVID hit. And so it all got canceled. So th they made sure that I got paid. Mm -hmm. I got paid and so I didn't really have to do anything. And uh, it's nice being around my family. I have a brother and a sister here. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, my mom and dad, you know, my dad just passed, but my mom. And so we got to, you know, um, uh, I got to spend a lot, a lot of time with them. So my family's here. So yeah, well, good. absolutely legendary stories. No, oh, thanks. Legendary, man. I, I think people are going to really enjoy him. And that's, I asked him too. He's not name dropping before people get on him for yeah. being yeah. on anything. I, I asked these questions. Yeah. Those bar stool. I see some of the comments on your thing. I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> that's, uh, these that's, guys are fans. That's just how it rolls. Man. <laughs> yeah. You know how it is. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks again, Dan. This you got great. it. Anytime. All right, everybody. That's it for today. Uh, we'll catch you guys next week.